Good evening. I'm Frank Hicks, the co-chairman of the Kennedy School's World Development Group. On behalf of the World Development Group and the Human Rights Program at the Law School, I welcome you to the annual, the ninth annual World Development Conference. The topic of this year's conference is international development and human rights. Our goals are first to examine the relationship between development efforts and human rights, and second, to explore how development organizations and professionals can better promote human rights in the future. The members of the student groups sponsoring the conference believe these are important issues that receive too little attention, both in the development literature and in the curricula of development programs. As policy students, we focus a great deal of attention on the economic and technical aspects of development policies but we typically pay little attention to the impact of such policies on the liberties and rights of individuals. And only rarely do we consider what can be done to actively promote justice and human dignity. We hope that this year's conference will begin to address this imbalance and foster a higher level of awareness of these important issues within the Harvard-Boston community. Human rights is a difficult and sensitive issue. In the secure confines of a university, it would be easy to make solemn pronouncements condemning all deviations from international norms. Instead, we hope to address head-on the difficulties both of defining human rights and defending them, especially in the face of development policies that may trade short-term economic and political sacrifice for long-term growth. This year, we have been fortunate in bringing together an exceptional group of human rights scholars and development practitioners to explore these issues with us. In addition to the keynote address this evening, we're also sponsoring four panel discussions, panel discussions tomorrow, beginning at 9 a.m. in Star Auditorium. Tomorrow you'll be able to enter Star Auditorium through the doors of the Belfer Center at the other end of the building. That's on this corner, Elliott and Kennedy Streets. Tomorrow's first panel begins by providing a philosophical framework for examining human rights within a development context. The second panel discussion features representatives from various development organizations who will describe their respective approaches to promoting human rights. The third panel will examine ethnic conflict as it relates to refugee populations. And the final panel will discuss the implications of macroeconomic adjustment policies for equity and human rights in developing countries. All the panel's discussions promise to be lively and enlightening, and we strongly encourage all of you who are able to attend tomorrow's sessions and to bring your questions about the various panel subjects. We are honored that a distinguished group representing such organizations as USAID, Oxfam America, the IMF, the Ford Foundation, the World Bank, and American Friends Service Committee have donated their time and expertise to these events. For all of those who have not re yet received a copy of tomorrow's schedule, programs will be available as you leave the forum this evening. This year's conference is the culmination of an encouraging year in the Kennedy School, in which international development issues have begun to receive greater attention. It is also the product of many people's contributions, and thanks are in order. First, we would like to thank Dean Allison for the interest he has shown in working with us to improve the school's international development program. We look forward to, to continuing to work with him to explore the possibility of creating an international development policy center within the Kennedy School. We also want to thank Dwight Perkins and the Harvard Institute for International Development for their financial and moral support. We're very pleased that HIID has moved in next door to the Kennedy School, and we're confident that the move will prove mutually beneficial for both institutions. We also thank our co-sponsor, the Law School's Human Rights Program, for its assistance. And we hope this is the beginning of further joint efforts between our programs. We're also grateful to the Institute of Politics for making the forum available to us this evening and for assisting us with our publicity efforts. The Kennedy School student government also provided additional financial assistance. Finally, I would like to thank all the panelists for agreeing to participate in our conference and especially Dr. Alara Otunu, who has traveled from France to join us this evening.
It now gives me great pleasure to welcome Dean Graham Allison to the podium to introduce our distinguished keynote speaker. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be part of this ninth annual World Development Conference, whose student organizers deserve our thanks for their many months of work that this program represents. And it's my special pleasure to welcome to the school tonight and introduce our speaker, the Honorable Olara A. Atunu. This conference topic for this year was very well chosen. According to Amnesty International, Human rights abuses occurred in 128 countries last year. In uh, Amnesty International's annual report, it states, quote, thousands of people are in prison because of their beliefs. Many are held without charge or trial. Torture and the death penalty are widespread. In many countries, men, women, and children have disappeared after being taken into official custody. Still others have been put to death without any pretense of legality, selected and killed by governments and their agents, close quote. From Afghanistan to South Africa, Eastern Europe to Chile, basic rights are ignored and hunger frequently flourishes. Tonight's speaker is no stranger to such tragedies. The son of a Christian preacher, Mr. Atunu was born in Uganda in 1950 under British colonial rule. In 1971, Idi Amin, one of the criminals of the century, assumed power and over the next year, over the next eight years, murdered some 300,000 people. Many more were tortured or imprisoned without trial. As a student in Uganda's Makere University until 1973, Mr. Atunu served as secretary of the Students' Guild. When he dared to criticize Idi Amin's crimes, he was forced to flee to Tanzania. As a student without a country, he earned a Fulbright scholarship and a BA in jurisprudence from Oxford in 1976 and a master's of law degree from Harvard in 1977. While working in New York and later as an assistant professor at Albany Law School, Mr. Otunu became the secretary general of the Uganda Freedom Union, a group of exiles opposed to Amin's tyranny. In 79, he returned to Africa and helped form the Uganda National Liberation Front. When Amin was finally overthrown, Mr. Atunu served as a member of Uganda's interim parliament before becoming Uganda's ambassador to the United Nations. During the five years he spent at the UN, he was vice president of the General Assembly, chairman of the UN African Group, an unofficial leader of the Third World Bloc, and chairman of the UN Commission on Human Rights. For two years, Mr. Atunu also sat on the Security Council, where he dealt with issues including the war in Lebanon, South Africa's presence in Namibia and Angola, the Falklands War, and Libya's invasion of Chad. While president of the Security Council in December 1981, he adroitly managed the complex political process that led to Perez de Cuellar's election as Secretary General. In 1985, Mr. Atunu became Uganda's foreign minister, but was forced into exile again following last year's victory by rebel forces. He's currently a member of the Aspen Institute's Board of Trustees and a founding associate of the John J. McCloy International Center for Decision Making. At the UN, he is often mentioned as a possible successor to Secretary General de Cuellar. His record has earned respect ac across the political spectrum. M recently, a U.S. Diplomat, diplomat commented that Mr. Otunu is, quote, fair, even-handed, imaginative and lucid, explaining complex choices with rare skill, close quote. We're very fortunate, therefore, in beginning this conference tonight to have to address us on the subject of Human Rights and Development, Mr. Atunu. Let's join me in a warm welcome for him, please. <laughs> 
very much for your very kind and uh, generous words of introduction. You will excuse me if I'm a little bit uh, sleepy and my voice is not very clear. It takes me a while to recover when I cross the Atlantic from Europe to the U.S. <clears throat> the conceptions of human rights and development as we know them today or much to the founding of the United Nations after the Second World War. In 1948, only three years after the founding of the United Nations, the UN General Assembly, inspired by the ideals of the Charter, proclaimed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This was to become the springboard for the development and elaboration of all categories of human rights subsequently. Before the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there did not exist a universal regime of human rights. To be sure, various notions of human rights within nations had existed for a long time in many parts of the world. The ideals embodied in the French Revolution of the United States Constitution and, why not, of the Bolshevik Revolution are perhaps the best examples of the earlier generation of human rights militancy. But they all remain limited in scope and applicability. And now, look at what has happened since 1948. Thanks largely to the work of the UN Commission on Human Rights and the participation of many non-governmental organizations and human rights activists, we have today a body of rights which cover virtually every aspect of individual and group rights you can think of. Just over this past year, we have witnessed two significant developments in this evolution, namely the coming into force of the African Charter of Human and People's Rights and the adoption by the UN General Assembly of the Declaration on the Right to Development last year. The significance of this remarkable evolution of human rights are twofold. First, it means that we can now speak a common language universally, from north to south, from east to west, on the matter of human rights. To me, this represents important progress, which we must not take for granted. Secondly, it means that even though governments and other concerned parties may not always be enthusiastic about these norms, nevertheless, they accept the fact that their actions must now be judged in terms of these new standards. Like in the sphere of human rights, so it has been in the field of development, at least in relation to the countries of Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean, that the founding of the United Nations in 1945 was also the most important landmark. For the first time, the right to self-determination was accorded universal recognition, and the new organization made it one of its objectives to assist colonial peoples to realize that right. Thus, whereas at the founding of the United Nations, the membership stood at some 51 member states, today, thanks to the success of decolonization, that number has swelled to 159. Why is this important? Because the idea of development, that is, the right of a people to develop themselves, springs directly from the right to self-determination. And the process of development takes off from where the process of decolonization has left. This is why with the emergence of the newly independent states 
began the important debate on the issue of development at national as well as international levels. The theme of this conference is especially important and appropriate because human rights and development are very closely linked, both conceptually and at the level of practice. However, this link has not always been apparent. Indeed, in the early years of independence, development tended to be measured largely in terms of national, gross national product and the rate of economic growth. But today, we know that development is much more than that. The concept of development has no meaning if it is not concerned with the development of the human person in all aspects. A development process is a means of enhancing the quality of life of the individual and the community, a means of realizing a life that is characterized by greater freedom, greater dignity, and greater material well-being. The human person, then, must be the center of development and the realization of his rights in all aspects, civil, political, economic, social, and cultural, must necessarily constitute the goal of the development process. And herein lies the link between human rights and development. But this link has given rise to an important question namely whether it is possible in societies on the path of development to devote the same attention to all categories of human rights. In particular, it has been argued that at this fragile stage of the development process, it is necessary to subordinate civil and political rights in the interest of the more important task of attaining economic and social rights. This is what uh, some have called the freedom of bread debate. Some commentators have gone further and argued that the realization of economic and social rights is a necessary prior condition for the enjoyment of civil and political rights. I understand well those sentiments. Some of the people who share that view have a serious commitment to the realization of both human rights and development. However, I believe that view is fundamentally mistaken. Take the question of freedom of speech. Does an illiterate peasant on the countryside have much interest in freedom of speech? It is true that the peasant has some objective limitations that do not make it possible for him to take full advantage of this right as compared, for example, to his compatriot from the intelligentsia. Nevertheless, the peasant has very definite views about his general condition, about such issues as land reform, government agricultural policy, the education of his children, or the conduct of the local officials. For his voice to be heard on these issues, he needs an atmosphere of freedom. In Latin America and in Asia, and to a lesser extent in Africa as well, there has been a progressive growth of grassroots groups and organizations around some of these issues so that far from being a luxury, freedom of expression is in fact a necessary means by which the peasant or those speaking on his behalf can articulate his interests and demand his rights. Under development on the political level is often characterized by the absence or weakness of democratic institutions the absence of well-established political processes and a relatively low level of political awareness among the people. The reversal of this condition through a process of political development 
is an important and necessary aspect of development in general. And yet political development cannot come about, can only come about through democratic participation. To freeze democratic participation is to freeze the process of political development. And that in turn retards development in general. There is also a more practical reason why the two categories of rights need to complement each other in the process of development. In an atmosphere of freedom and participation, the people tend to cooperate more readily with the state and produce more. This is important because for development to take place, the people must become the principal agents of that process. This is the best way to achieve development. And finally, experience has shown that with hardly any exceptions, the curtailment of political and civil rights in the name of development often degenerates into a situation of general repression. Thus, the notion of denying one category of human rights in order to better concentrate on fulfilling another is, in my view, difficult to justify at the level of principle and has proven dangerous in practice. On the contrary, we must emphasize the indivisible and interdependent character of all human rights, which admits of neither hierarchy nor priority and which requires that equal attention be devoted to the realization of civil and political rights as well as economic and social rights. This position has been recognized by the United Nations first in its, the General Assembly Resolution of 1977 and again in the Declaration of the Rights to Development which was adopted last year. This being said, there are a few considerations without which any perspective on the conception of human rights that I've discussed above would be incomplete. Whereas all human rights must be given equal weight, there is a difference in the method of implementation between civil and political rights on the one hand and economic and social rights on the other. Respect of the former requires that the state should abstain from doing anything which would undermine the enjoyment of those rights. This requirement of non-interference, if you will, which is negative in character, depends for its implementation entirely on the political will of governments. This is not the case with regard to economic and social rights. The implementation of economic and social rights requires positive action by the state, building hospitals, schools, and roads, or ensuring adequate levels of food, all involve the provision of services and benefits which require material resources. Therefore, the capacity of a state to implement these group of rights will necessarily depend on the resources at its disposal. Then there is the issue of the duties as opposed to the rights of individuals. That the individual may demand of the state his rights is agreed. But in return, the state is entitled to demand of the individual the performance of certain duties. Both aspects of this relationship are important, and we must avoid the temptation of stressing one to the exclusion of the other. In the context of the United States, we often recall President Kennedy's inaugural address in which he was moved to tell his countrymen to ask not what their country could do for them, but rather what they could do for their country. Now, if this notion has a place in the most developed country on earth, then how much more relevant is this 
for a developing society where the sense of togetherness is a necessary condition for development. In this regard, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights has blazed uh, somewhat of a new trail by providing not only for the rights of individuals, but also for the duties of individuals vis-a-vis -vis the community and the state. The other issue concerns democratic discipline. We noted earlier how important it is to discuss and decide on issues democratically. Now we must distinguish between that and the tendency, on the other hand, to indulge in endless debates for the sake of debate, or the practice not unknown in this country of filibuster. The one is important and necessary for development, while the other represents the kind of overkill that developing countries cannot afford. Decisions need to be made not only democratically, but also expeditiously. And what is more, the demands of development require that once decisions have been made democratically on given issues, all concerned should cooperate in their implementation, regardless of the positions they may have taken at the stages of debate and decision making. And closely related to the question of democratic discipline is a matter of tolerance, political tolerance. In a pluralistic society, which most developing countries are, divergent tendencies are bound to exist. Those who find themselves in a, in a majority position need to avoid the temptation of using their numerical strength to ride roughshod over those in a minority. The majority have a responsibility to be sensitive to the views of the minority. It is especially important to avoid a situation where one group, however composed, is always on the winning side while another is reduced to being a permanent loser. For their part, those who find themselves in a minority position from time to time need to respect democratic decisions and cooperate in their implementation. For the minority, they should avoid the temptation to resort to sabotage to frustrate implementations of decisions which have been arrived democratically. In short, in developing countries, there is need for a more flexible and sensitive interplay between winners and losers in the political arena, if there is to be both democracy and stability. This then is the conception of human rights as I see it in the context of development. And now I should like to turn to a discussion of some of the factors that affect the realization of human rights and development in many countries. It must be stated from the outset that the primary responsibility for the realization of human rights and development rests with the developing countries themselves. And for this reason, in my discussion, I will deliberately concentrate on the internal factors. First, there is the question of national unity. Internal conflicts with different overtones continue to plague many developing countries, especially those in Africa. In some cases, the seeds of the present conflicts were planted long ago during the colonial era when the policy of divide and rule was deliberately pursued by the colonial powers in order to keep colonial peoples weak and divided. Unfortunately, in the post-colonial era, some leaders have continued to employ this same method in order to gain or retain power. In Africa, these conflicts have become a political hemorrhage draining the collective strength of our peoples, rendering states weak and unstable, retarding the process of development, and leaving in their wake 
terrible suffering for millions of people. It is a measure of this problem that the African continent alone has over 5 million refugees, which is half the total of refugees worldwide. In such conditions of conflict, the goals of human rights and development both suffer. There is, in my view, only one way to resolve these conflicts. That is by seeking out and building national consensus. I do not say that this is an easy option to follow, for there are other more tempting shortcuts available. But I'm convinced that this is the only democratic and principled way of coming to grips with the conflict situation. And in the long run, it is the only way of ensuring that the energies and resources presently consumed by these conflicts will be released and redeployed for development. Secondly, there is the question of democracy. I have already discussed earlier the importance of democracy to the development process. I only wish to add here that the forms of democratic practice may rightly vary from one country to another. For example, some countries have opted for experiments in one-party democracy, while others have adopted multi-party parliamentary arrangements. What matters in each case is not so much the form chosen by a country, although this is by no means relevant, but the practice and reality which lies behind the form. Do the citizens of a country in fact have a meaningful opportunity to influence the course of events in their country? That is the question. And I dare say that the answer is not always what meets the eye. Thirdly, there is an issue of fairness or social justice. We noted earlier that the performance of a state with regard to the implementation of economic and social rights must be judged in relation to its level of development and the resources available to it. That is understandable. On the other hand, what is unacceptable is the rapidly growing gap among different social classes in many developing countries. The distortion in the distribution of resources is especially striking as between the rural areas and the urban centers. The vast majority of the people live in the rural areas, and it is in the rural people who produce the food and cash crops that form the mainstay of the economies of many developing countries. Yet, at the level of distribution, the bulk of the national wealth is consumed in the cities. It is imperative that national resources be distributed more equitably. This is a matter of social justice. But it's also good economic policy. For if those who produce national wealth see that the fruit of their labor is brought back to benefit them, they will be motivated to produce more. Fourthly, there is a matter of corruption. In some developing countries today, corrupt practices have reached endemic proportions, resulting in the diversion of considerable public resources into private hands and decisions on public projects and contracts being made on the calculation of illicit private gains rather than in the public interest. This leads to general distortion of the development process. But in addition, there are other aspects of this phenomenon which are now taking root, and which, if not arrested, will have very negative consequences in the long run. I refer, for example, to the fact that in some countries today, corruption has reached virtually every sector of the public service. Why is this thing spreading like the dry season fire? The spiral, the spiral of inflation and the forbidding cost of living 
have left the lower echelons of the public service who earn very modest salaries with very little choice. They are forced to cut corners in order to make ends meet. Of course, the bad example of some of the bosses have made it easier for the lower functionaries to follow suit. And worst of all, there are signs that corruption is slowly being accepted as a normal way of conducting public business. If corruption is normalized in the public mind, and with the practice becoming so pervasive in many countries, I fear that we may have on our hands a new subculture, one which could assume an autonomous existence beyond the conditions that have given rise to it. I also fear that the full implications of this development are not yet adequately appreciated. Fifthly, there is the question of the rapid growth in population. In Africa, for example, the rate of population growth has long outdistanced the rate of economic growth. This has increased enormously the pressure on arable land, the pressure on jobs, and the pressure on social services such as schools and hospitals. This demographic, this demographic trend has rightly aroused much concern at both the national and international levels. Many people ask, especially abroad, why is it that with all the aid for family planning and the facilities that are now more readily available in many countries, the results are not more noticeable? <coughs> Why indeed? There is the factor of infant mortality, which still continues to take an acceptably high toll on African children. In fact, one can tell the impact of infant mortality on the African countryside from the incidence of fatalistic names in some parts of Africa. In Uganda, for example, there are still too many children bearing names such as Oto, which means he too will die like the others before him. Or Yiro, which means I have buried many before her. In these circumstances, how can you persuade a mother to have fewer children? She will try to have as many children as possible in the hope that some will survive to be adults. Then there is a factor of what one might call social insurance. When the state is not able to provide a system of social security for the old and the sick, people have to rely on their relatives and parents to rely on their children. In the villages, one still hears all too often the following refrain, and who will take care of me in sickness and in my old age, if not my children? It is interesting to note in parentheses, that the African Charter gives a formal status to a tradition which has always been there by making it a duty for individuals not only to respect their parents at all times, but also to maintain them in the case of need. The mode of agricultural production in the countryside is very labor-intensive. Many people still believe that the more hands they can have for working on the land, the better. In many societies, too, children are still considered as a status symbol. The more children, the greater the prestige for the family. Now, against these odds, it is not surprising that the efforts of family planning organizations have not made much of an impression on the local people. In order to come to grips with the population problem, one must fight infant mortality by producing, by providing better health care for child and mother, 
one must reduce ignorance by providing a better level of education for both women and men, and one must improve the mode of agricultural production for, by providing better tools to the peasants. The population issue illustrates well how the different development problems cannot be viewed in isolation from each other and from the general socio-economic context in which they arise. The best way, therefore, to tackle these problems is through an integrated approach. The factors which I have discussed so far call for action primarily at the national levels. But efforts at the national levels alone however well conceived and vigorously pursued, are not sufficient to produce acceptable levels of development. Here is where a second dimension of an integrated approach becomes imperative, namely the impact of external factors on internal conditions. Take the issue of commodities, for example, whereby developing countries produce raw materials for the industries of the North, but without having any control over the pricing system, with the fluctuations in many, with, with the fluctuations and in many cases the collapse of the prices of their commodities, developing countries have to produce more and more in order to learn to earn less and less. And with the reduced revenue, they have to buy manufactured goods from the north where prices continue to escalate, but with the developing countries badly need for development projects. This is a case of running as fast as you can in order to remain on the same spot. In such conditions, what development plans can be worked out? much less executed. Developing countries rightly demand fair and stable remuneration for their export commodities through mechanisms such as commodity agreements and compensation financing. Or consider the debt burden, which is estimated to reach the level of 1,000 billion US dollars this year. A quarter of the total export earnings of developing countries today is being eaten up by debt repayments and debt charges. It is estimated that debt servicing obligations alone will cost African countries between 15 and 25 billion US dollars every year between now and the year 1990. In reality, this means that the preoccupations of governments will no longer be the building of schools, hospitals, or roads, but debt servicing and the repayment of debt. Meanwhile, international recession, high interest rates, the decline of official development assistance in real terms, and increased protectionism all continue to exert an extremely negative impact and the development of developing countries. It is this asymmetry in international economic relations that gave rise to the call for North-South dialogue since the early 70s, and specifically to the project of global negotiations. That is the idea of convening an international conference to make a global review of the major factors affecting international economic relations with a view to making necessary reforms in a coordinated and deliberate fashion. Yet today, with the situation in developing countries remaining as critical as ever, the project of global negotiations is all but forgotten. Why did the efforts to launch global negotiations fail? I know that the official explanation, no doubt, speaks of the failure to agree on the agenda and the fora to which various items were to be assigned. 
However, as one who chaired the last serious efforts to launch global negotiations in 1983, it was clear to me, and it is fair to say, that the Western industrialized countries had simply lost interest in the project. The interest of the West was in reality linked to the energy crisis, which began with the sudden increase in the price of oil in 1973. Now, with the waning of the oil power in the 80s, also came the waning of Western interest for a project such as global negotiations. Will it take another crisis similar to the energy crisis to resuscitate Western interest in North-South dialogue? I don't know. But what I do know is that the force of solidarity alone will not and cannot do it. Many people in the West may well say to themselves privately, am I my brother's keeper? Perhaps you are not your brother's keeper. But in an interdependent world, your own well-being partly depends on the well-being of your brother. The deterioration in the conditions of developing countries cannot continue without having serious repercussions on international peace and security as a whole. We have to be concerned for each other's welfare, not for the sake of charity, but because our common security and welfare depend on it. This therefore calls for appropriate measures in favor of development at both national and international levels. It is only in the context of such cooperative efforts that the aspirations of the peoples of developing countries for a life of greater freedom, greater dignity, and greater material well-being can be realized. It is only then that we could look at the changed landscape of the developing countries and say, yes, this is development. This is progress. But until then, there is a lot of work, a lot of work to be done by all of us, you and me together. Thank you very much. Ambassador Otuno is uh, prepared to uh, take some questions and answers. Let me encourage you in putting your questions to use the microphones here on the ground floor on the right-hand side or the left-hand side. I would urge you to put your points uh, uh, succinctly and as questions, and uh, I'll let uh, the ambassador uh, recognize the questions as we go, but we'll start over here. Uh, ambassador Otuno. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, as a citizen of a developed country, uh, there have been efforts in our history to tie foreign assistance, both economic and military, to the status of human rights in individual countries. Do you regard such bilateral efforts to promote human rights as effective, and what kinds of policies do you recommend for developed countries to promote the quality of human rights in individual developing countries? Well, let me say, first of all, that uh, it's a very interesting coincidence in the way in which the two biggest powers in the world give aid to developing countries, namely the emphasis which both the United States and the Soviet Union tend to give to military assistance as a component of their official bilateral aid. And secondly, the emphasis which strategic considerations play in which country gets what and how much. 
the figures on this are, are startling in some, uh, in some uh, cases. So clearly, there is a relevance here because one of the things which is consuming a lot of resources for developing countries is precisely military expenditure, most of which sometimes ends up being used not so much for national defense, but in internal conflicts. A lot of saving could be made if less arms were bought, and there probably would be better conditions of human rights as well. That's one level. The other level is more immediately relevant to your question of how a linkage could be worked out between the giving of aid and human rights. I myself have absolutely no objection to it. It is more difficult to say in practice how that should be worked out so that the system be not abused in human rights. I myself have absolutely no objection to it. It is more difficult to say in practice how that should be worked out so that the system be not abused. Because whereas, for example, at the international level, non-governmental organizations tend to be concerned only for human rights, Governments tend to have, in the nature of things, mixed agenda. So it's more complicated to see how it should be worked out in practice, but in principle is something which I would find uh, acceptable. But many may disagree on a particular case whether the uh, consideration taken into account were justified or not justified, whether they're the real considerations or they are the rationalization for some other consideration which have nothing to do with the human rights and these are issues which can be debated and on which two reasonable people may disagree. Ambassador Otuno, uh, I would like to place on record a compliment for the organization of African unity countries who indeed have been a model in terms of uh, protection for refugees in drawing up the Convention of the African Unity uh, for Refugees, which is uh, much broader in its term to include and reflect the particular situation of Africa and include a much larger number of persons falling under the category of refugees but yet uh, we still do face problems like military attacks over the border of refugee camps, uh, which recently has happened in Botswana and many other countries. Do you feel that uh, the international community, specifically the United Nations, should be taking some specific, more drastic action in order to avoid this kind of attacks and violent um, uh, violations of human rights and refugee rights? Well, I think that the, uh, the situation of refugees in Southern Africa is, of course, very special because of the attitude of the South African government towards those refugees. In the rest of Africa, I think, on the whole, there has been a very good history of hospitality to refugees. But of late, there have been problems of the following nature. When refugees go from one country to another, but the recipient country has problems of its own, such as an internal conflict, and they then get caught up in the partisan problems of that country. Refugees have had problems along those uh, lines. And of course, there's one particular country which is uh, a, a different kind of problem, namely, a country which has said it is not in a position ever to take back its refugee, its, its citizens. In other words, for most countries, you hope things settle down and the refugees can go back. But for one particular country, for reasons of politics, agriculture, geography, and so on, it says we cannot take back our refugees. And this has been a problem, which has been discussed between the country, neighbors, and UNHCR. But otherwise, 
on the whole, I think African countries have been hospitable. But with regard to Southern Africa and the policy of the Pretoria government towards Southern African refugees and the neighboring countries, that of course requires very special attention of the international community. And there have been various efforts in the context of the United Nations, in the context of UNSCR, to do something about this. Some pressure is being felt, but not enough to make much of an impact. Do you have any specific uh, recommendations? In this kind of a forum, uh, what should be done in addition in order to prevent recurrence of such gross violations? Well, fortunately, I'm speaking uh, in the U.S. The U.S. is still, uh, I think, in relation to South Africa, a very powerful country. South Africa feels uh, any pinch from here. And what can be done is surely in terms of international pressure by countries which have leverage in Pretoria. And the U.S., if it hasn't got the biggest leverage, it's got one of the biggest. And uh, in this country, because of the system of democracy you have, people write to congressmen and to senators, and there are all sorts of things that people can do here to get their points of view across and to get their representatives to take interest in a point of view which they hold. That is something practical which definitely can be done. But I realize that uh, there are difficulties. There are other political considerations which come into account. There are strategic considerations. And those are realities of life which we, we recognize even if we don't agree with them. Thank you. If I be allowed to perhaps a second question uh, in terms of Uh, the Secretary General Hammarskjöld, who in the 50s said in many occasions without resolution or even approval of the Security Council, he has taken actions within the framework of his own mandate or the good offices in order to prevent massive human rights violations. Now the uh, number of sovereign countries in the United Nations have grown to 159, and it has been shown that many of the non-aligned countries from the developing world have been an increasingly important pressure group. Do you foresee that there is a possibility that they could put a counterbalance to the veto rights in the Security Council at some point? Well, <laughs> You cannot change the veto structure without the concurrence of the veto powers. That is the answer. <laughs> It's a perfect situation. So there have been debates and discussions about the pros and cons of the system, but you cannot change the system without those who control the veto agreeing to it. But having said that, to me the most important question really is not so much whether the structure of the Security Council will be changed. I do not foresee that in the near future. But whether the possibilities which exist within the present structure are being fully used, that really is the question. Namely, whether, for example, those who hold veto power use their veto power responsibly and in a way which enhances the role of the Security Council whether non-veto powers play their role responsibly, whether, for example, the Secretary General uses as much as he might Article 99 of the Charter, whether there are ways in which procedures could be improved, which have nothing to do with the Charter, they can be improved to make uh, the work of the Council more expeditious, whether decisions which have been passed by the Council, including the concurrence of the veto powers uh, by the nature of things, whether those decisions which have actually been taken are implemented, And if all the powers represented by the Security Council bring the full weight of their influence to bear on decisions they have taken to ensure that is implemented. That to me really is the, uh, is the, should be the, the, the focus of attention right now because within there there's plenty of, of, of uh, improvements which could be made which would not touch one bit the present structure of the Charter. So, I mean, in a, in a sense, the, 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 the Charter reform thing can very easily become a kind of red herring. And in some cases, it has been used in that way. You have uh, mentioned 
the uh, importance of uh, interest rates and other things, debt in relationship uh, to uh, human rights development. You haven't commented on the uh, role that would be played or could be played by the uh, World Bank, International Monetary Fund, and other such uh, agencies. And it is uh, alleged, at least at times, that they are very uh, destructive of the sort of uh, solidarity and consensus that you think is uh, necessary in order to have uh, human rights and uh, development. And I'm wondering if you would comment on that. Well, um, thank you. I, I, I did not uh, explicitly comment on it. So let me elaborate a little bit under the, the shorthand of the global negotiation, because under this project, among the issues which would have been discussed is the question of money and finance. And therefore, the, the functions of the financial institutions, of the IMF and the World Bank, the, the decision-making procedure, but also the way in which policies are, are, are determined, the conditionality system within those organizations. And among the most controversial aspect of global negotiations when the discussion was underway to launch global negotiations was one, where do you discuss the question of money and finance? Do you discuss it within IMF and World Bank? And if you do, do you discuss it within the present decision-making structure within the World Bank and IMF? And if so, what difference will that then make to the present situation? So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue about which developing countries naturally feel very strongly, but one on which uh, the, the Western countries especially feel very sensitive, and there has simply been an impasse on the, uh, on the matter. Ambassador Otunu, I was struck uh, yesterday listening to the news of BBC that something like six out of nine of the reports in the world news dealt with human rights in some form or another. And my impression was that human rights is becoming more and more of a yardstick for evaluating international relations, the conduct of governments, and so on. Could you tell us something about the effect or the impact human rights have on relations, on political and economic relations between the African nations? Um. Among the African nations, I would say not very much. It, it, it depends on the region and relationship between leaders and so on. A lot tend to be conducted at a very informal level. However, at the level of the OAU, there has now been the formal step of the African Charter coming into force. And interesting enough, the African Charter provides a mechanism for monitoring the uh, the the law, setting up a commission, and complaints can be sent to that commission, and governments are informed of what has been received and so on. It will be very interesting to see how that works. However, with regard to um, African countries and the international community outside, especially the donor community, yes, increasing the question of human rights has become an issue. In my view, for the better, for the better, even though there's controversy as to whether when human rights is invoked by a donor country, it is actually the reason for the action which is being taken, or whether this has become a convenient rubric under which certain um, other policies are pursued. This is a debatable issue, and it will vary from one case to another. Also, it depends on the donor, the donor country. Some donor countries are known for reasonably clear commitment to human rights without more. Others have much more complex system of international uh, relations. So it very, it'll vary very much from one case to another. Ambassador <clears throat> Otunu. I was particularly concerned about your observations you made about uh, the impact or the necessity of foreign aid in our development process. As a member of the Third World na uh, Nation, uh, we've seen a lot of examples of what aid has done. We've seen uh, complicated, complex, ultra-modern uh, projects like dams and electricity projects and, you know, name them, uh, telecommunication, satellites, uh, you know, and all kinds of things. 
a lot of those things have worked over the years. In fact, some countries have received a lot of aid, like Tanzania received $2 billion over a period of 10 years during the time uh, McMurray was president of the World Bank. And uh, I was surprised that you're still pushing or still emphasizing the fact that uh, foreign aid still remains a necessary ingredient in our development. Is, is, isn't that really you know, just throwing good money after bad? I mean, it hasn't had the kind of impact people thought. I mean, a lot of people, you know, would travel through Africa or some other parts of the third world and say, gee, these people are really poor. I mean, like, you see the Maasai and say, oh, gosh, those people have no clothes, they have no shoes, they have no food, they have no houses, they don't have these or that or the other. I mean, that really is not poverty. That is just a different culture. Now, we've taken that and we've defined that as, as, as poverty and we go down there and we build a an expensive runway to bring uh, super conquer to land there, hoping that the tourists will bring money in there. No one goes there. Uh, isn't it time to really rethink this question of aid? And, and right now, what, what I'm myself thinking is, shouldn't we stop entirely or in, encourage you know, developed countries never to send aid to developing nations except in the event of a disaster like an earthquake or a flood or something like that, instead of just sending year after year sending aid, you know, in peacetime when really, actually that aid has even become uh, counterproductive because a lot of people who would have otherwise, you know, stayed at home to exercise their own creativity are not appreciated by their own governments. I mean, most of us who are here, it's not because we are, we are not capable of doing some of those projects, but if I go home and look for a job as an engineer to build a dam with my ideas, the government is going to tell me, no, we can't trust you. We would rather have somebody from the World Bank or the IMF or UNEP, United Nations Development Program. And these guys go there, they build the thing. After two years, they walk away, the thing collapses. They've sank $2 billion and no one is there to run it. Do we call that development, really? Do you still say that is still necessary? I actually agree with almost all your description. It's very accurate. <laughs> but your conclusion is a different matter. It is true that there's been much waste. And it is true that uh, there have been mistaken decisions. And as I said in my remarks, some of these have been contributed to by corruption, some honest mistakes. So we have to look at what went wrong. And that will give us the answer what should now be done next. I do not believe that if you look at what went wrong, whether in Tanzania or in some other country, the outcome will be that the reception of aid from abroad produced the trend which you are describing. I think mistakes have been made, mistakes of policy. There were, in countries, for example, choices made for grand projects which didn't really fit in. Not always a mistake of the receiving countries alone, even donor countries. Uh, there were times when donor countries preferred more visible projects, projects which also brought prestige to them, just like the receiving government wanted projects which brought prestige. So mistakes have been made, but the good news is that, in my estimation, there is serious efforts being made by most governments in Africa to correct these mistakes. They will be slow in coming, the results may not show very much, but these mistakes are being acknowledged, they are being corrected, and it is no longer possible for any African country, much less the continent as a whole, to live in isolation. It's not possible. Africa is very part of the international community. We shall always be. We must receive everything we can, but use it properly. That is really the issue. Aid for schools are there, they have been very useful for hospitals, for building roads. Not all the aids have been for dams which do not work. And that also must be said, it's part of the history which we've had over the last 20 years. It's been, the, the balance sheet is not quite as uh, black and white as it may appear. Anyway... I say that I have a supplementary question. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we've been receiving aid for a long time, you know, and if you look at other countries that have received aid, they didn't receive it as long as we've done. There are countries in Africa who have been independent for 30 years, 
And you would think in the 30 years into independence, they'll be reaching a takeoff stage. And yet, they're even worse off now than they were on the day of independence. So my question is, why should we continue to receive this aid year after year, year after year, and every time the president, like uh, president of the U.S. tries to reduce his contribution to the World Bank, it's not the Americans that complain, it's the African countries that complain. I mean, because they need a bigger increase the World Bank so they can go in there and, and deep in more and more. Now, this, this really has created a, a climate of dependence. You know, we are in a kind of poverty trap. We'll never come out of it. Unless we get aid, we can't really pay our own civil servants at home. You see? Now, my question is, show me any country, really, in the world that has developed purely by depending on, on aid, on foreign aid. I mean, not Japan or West Germany, you know, those received some aid, but for like four years, I think it was. That was the end of it. We've been receiving aid for 30 years, and there's no end in sight. I'm sure in the next 25 years, or even by the time I retire, Kenya will still be receiving aid, and even more then than now. So what is... What is I, I agree what, what with is, you about the danger of a dependency mentality. That is a real danger, which has to be watched and has to be avoided. But it is not true that the only explanation, even the main explanation for the things which went wrong in many countries is to do with the reception of aid from abroad. There are many factors, some of which I discussed earlier, which explains what went wrong in many countries. Of course, one has to go into a lot more detail and specificity from one country to another. But one can't generalize too much and say the main problem has been the reception of aid from abroad. And uh, I think also it has to be uh, you know, said that, well, true, um, the dangers are there, but even internally the things which we do, there are many dangers involved. We can't run away from making choices, hard choices, from learning from our mistakes. So I, I, I agree with you, we must watch this aid thing, but the answer to me is not to cut ourselves off from the outside world and try to develop on our own, it is true, as I said in my, my speech, that the primary responsibility rests with the developing countries. Of course, most of the work has to be done with the developing countries. But the efforts of developing countries on their own, with the factors of international economic relations such as they are, cannot possibly uh, make it, cannot possibly attain the required level of development. It is not possible. But I take your point. So, Ambassador, I uh, noticed in your speech you suggested that to the extent appeals to charity and humanity have not succeeded in triggering the kind of assistance we need from the West, we should uh, begin to stress uh, issues of interdependence and that um, the, the success and prosperity of the third world, in, in, a, in a sense, uh, impacts on the West, and that should excite them to, to um, respond and do something. I was just wondering whether you had any thoughts on how that kind of model could be enhanced because different countries in, in the developing world uh, command you know, varying strategic and economic significance. And to that extent, Africa, for example, is not going to attract as much attention under your model. So I was wondering what thoughts you might have on that. Well, I'm, I just know that uh, the a spirit of uh, human solidarity we are all brothers and sisters, has not done it, in my experience, is very unlikely to do it. And I think the sooner one sort of realizes and accepts that, the better. The people who make decisions on these matters tend to be very hard-nosed uh, people who are not very moved by those kinds of considerations. So, if anything is going to make a difference, it has to be something connected with the self-interest of the industrialized North. And there are many points of self-interest. I think the problem there is that sometimes decision makers do not project the consequences of decision in the long term. Because seeing how our futures are linked to each other in the long term is, 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 is easy enough. But decisions are made on short-term basis and short-term benefits we tend to ignore even the hard facts of how we depend on each other and how 
if things go so bad in the developing countries, it will of course have impact on the industrialized north as well. A difficult message to convey even across the conference table. But if this is not realized and something is done collectively soon, well, the facts slowly but surely will begin to impose themselves on us. There's no other, there's no other way. Mr. Ambassador, uh, you have rightly pointed out that uh, the instability which is existing now in, uh, in mostly African countries is uh, uh, mainly relates to historical uh, factors. And when we see uh, the, these historical factors, we find that it is a transition, it is a, net, a transition period. And taking one country as an individual country, whether one group comes to power or the other, it is going to be an informal one rather than a formal transition of state or state succession could, uh, could not be stable or formal for, for some time during this transition period. And that uh, is going to have an impact on development policies because all res resources, as you said, is uh, going to be mobilized for uh, conflict within the states. What I uh, would like to uh, ask is that if that is the case, uh, is it not appropriate now to think of appropriate develop development policy under the present situation? Because whether one uh, group or the other group comes into power, it's all the same. But thinking of development policy is the appropriate uh, thing because uh, the basis for stability comes from uh, appropriate uh, development policy. What do you think uh, the appropriate development policy should be? And do you think that the stress on purely human rights and purely social and, economic, uh, social and political rights should proceed or should be the same when we, th we talk in terms of stability and development policy? Well, two things. One is that uh, clearly we cannot move faster than the objective conditions which obtain in our countries. We cannot manufacture situations which do not exist on the ground. So we, we can only develop, in a sense, in relation to what there is there. Our level of development cannot jump certain stages. So I agree with you there. For example, I accept that in my own lifetime in Africa, there probably will not be a state of democracy which is satisfactory to me or to you. I accept this. But I also recognize that every little room which becomes available to increase the level of democracy should be taken advantage of. So that you are, you, you are progressing, you are improving, even if the ideal may remain distant. But uh, two, I would not agree that in a conflict situation, the thing to do is to say, well, how can we have a development strategy which accepts this situation? Unless one is simply talking of a situation where there are disagreements and cleavages within the society. But if a conflict has erupted into, say, an armed conflict in a country, by definition, the preoccupation of everybody is that war or whatever else is going on there. It is simply not possible to talk in terms of conducting reasonable development processes in that sort of situation. The only answer, in my view, in that case, is to tackle the root of the problem, which is to tackle the conflict itself how to end that conflict. As I said in my speech, it's a very difficult thing. It's not easy. You know, the, the, the option, the temptation is to import more arms and overcome the other fellow. Then the problem is solved. So our leaders think. But really, the only solution to it is one which doesn't involve arms. The more difficult one uh, of seeking a national consensus. And this, after all, is a mode of politics which many African societies are perfectly used to. That's how, well before the colonial period, many societies used to conduct business. There were wars and fighting, but on the whole, when there were differences, people tried to find a compromise 
accept the other's point of view, find a middle ground which is um, in the interest of everybody, and proceed on that basis. And in many African countries, there is enough middle ground on which most people can stand. Most people want to have schools, they want to have roads. You can begin by the needs which everybody has in common. But of course, in reality, the leaders, political ambitions and other reasons, uh, find it uh, more convenient to pursue wars and conflicts. But on that I feel very strongly that really the only way is not to find a corner around it, but to tackle that problem head on, however difficult it may be. And once you contain that problem in a democratic way, you can then concentrate on development. Without it, it is very difficult. I, I have been uh, noticing that it's uh, become uh, close to our witching hour here, and it's almost 3.30 a.m. Uh, for the <laughs> ambassador for the day that he started. Though can he you still understand what I'm saying? He doesn't, uh, <laughs> I don't. He doesn't seem to be uh, flagging. So uh, we, if we can, to take uh, one last question. It's a question concerning human rights and the IMF World Bank. Uh, relationship. Um, some responses to pressures to in increase human rights considerations for the policies of the World Bank and the IMF have been that this is an undue politicization of those institutions. Uh, what did, is your reaction to that and what do you see as the prospects of those attempts at increasing human rights considerations? Well, really, you know, this is, um, again, somewhat related to an earlier question we discussed, that uh, in principle, there is no reason why human rights and development, if I'm right in saying that the two are linked, and that the true measure of development is whether, in fact, it delivers human rights in all the categories. If I'm right in that, then it makes sense, should be accepted. But, of course, I recognize the difficulty in practice of determining in a particular case how to apply this standard. And secondly, of whether what is being said officially corresponds to the actual reasons for steps which are being taken. And unfortunately, in international politics, this is always something which is rather important. And one has to keep asking. And in the context of the IMF, you know, given the problem the IMF has been having, the IMF and the World Bank, but especially the IMF with the developing countries, I can understand the sensitivity of developing countries on that issue. But it's something which has to be, to be discussed. Uh, it has to be a dialogue about it. The criteria have to be reasonably clear and objective. If they're clear and if they're objective and they're applied across the board without discrimination, without uh, looking into how your political system or your politics is this or that way, it would be acceptable. I wish there was a, an easier answer I could give to that, but uh, that's the best I can, I can do. On behalf of uh, the conference and uh, Harvard's uh, John F. Kennedy School of Government, I want to say how honored we are to have uh, our speaker here tonight and how much we've all appreciated his comments. So, uh, Thank you very much. All of you took the time to be here, and uh, I hope to see some of you tomorrow and to have more time to learn from you. Thank you very much. On behalf of the sponsors, I'm supposed to say that there are programs for tomorrow by the door as you leave, and the show starts at 9 o'clock. So, thank you. <laughs>